Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, so I will try to give a blackboard talk. Please complain if I start to step out of the camera range or right outside of the camera range. Uh, I will not be upset by that. Uh, so uh, I will talk about the ground state energy of the, say, the dilute Bose gas. And I will explain in a moment what, uh, what I mean by that. Uh, but I should start by saying that everything here is, is joined with the uh, 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 So anyway, from Copenhagen University in Denmark, uh, who, uh, who was also a member here some years ago. Um, good. So what is the what is the setup that we want to consider? Uh, Everything I say today will be three dimensions. Uh, so what the situation you should think about is that you have a large number of quantum particles. So n particles. Uh, let me put them as dots here. So they interact with each other. They are quantum particles, and then they interact with each other through pair potential. So, 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 so everybody interacts with everybody. And I think of having here a very large box of side, side length L. Uh, and the, the important parameter, one important parameter, will be the particle density. So the number of particles per unit volume. So that's, of course, n divided by a cubed. If I have from the three dimensions, and I have a cube of side length L. And of course, there will be, of course, also be an a dependence on the potential between the particles that I will write as B, which for the moment think of it just as being positive. There will be other assumptions along the way. And but so the particle with coordinates xi, so this i particle it has position xi in R3, uh, there will be a, a potential energy between xi and xj uh, given by the pair of potential V, so V of xi minus xj. And I should say that I will not repeat that too much, but, but you should always think of the, the, the potential as being radial. So it's a radial and positive potential. Uh, so really, it doesn't matter whether the configuration is like this, or whether they have the same distance. But, but, but uh, so you could maybe say that this distance here is somewhat similar to well, maybe, maybe that distance that's stretching it a little bit. Uh, so, so, so the potential energy between between this pair and that pair is the same. Okay. And now, what we want to understand is that if we have a large number of quantum particles in a large box so that the density is fixed, then we would like to understand the ground state energy of that quantum system. And now, uh, of course, just like that, it doesn't make sense because there will be some uh, dependence on the, on the boundary condition. And therefore, actually, you could say that to simplify things, we want to take a limit. We want to really take the limit of L going to infinity, keeping the density of particles fixed. So that uh, the, you only really see the bulk effects and the, and the boundary effects should hopefully have disappeared. Now, the fact that the boundary effects disappear is a theorem, uh, but, but the sort of below what, what, what's going on. I will not really be talking about, about boundary conditions. And actually, if you really were to look at the details of what I'm doing today, I will, at certain points, shift between different points of view where you have different boundary conditions without necessarily telling you so. Uh, but, but, uh, but in the proofs, of course, everything is mathematically rigorous. So when you do a proof, you fix a boundary condition, and then you do estimates with that boundary condition. So that's the. That's the setup. So you really want to have, say, uh, the uh, maybe a little bit more precise over here. Uh, you have the the a Hamiltonian, so uh, the energy operator in quantum mechanics, which will be a kinetic energy since we're talking about non-relativistic non-relativistic particles. That's just going to be the kinetic energy for each particle. The, the, the Laplacian for each particle, and then there's a sum of these pair potentials. I want to turn up J. Um, this gives me the energy, 
and uh, energy as an operator, and then the ground state energy will be the lowest point in the spectrum of this self-adjoint operator. Self-adjoint, once you specify the, the, the boundary conditions appropriately, um, and uh, uh, this uh, you can of course calculate by, uh, by the, uh, uh, the, the, the variational uh, principle for, 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 for the lowest eigenvalue, so this would be the femur of psi sub psi sub psi squared, where the psi here has to be taken in the appropriate Hilbert space. Now, to start out with, you would really think of, okay, the way I've presented it here, you would want to just put each particle in a, in a copy of L2 of the box, where uh, lambda is my box, so that's just the three-dimensional box of side length L. Um, and, and, and in that sense, this is just, if you want, one of the most fundamental questions. In quantum mechanics, you look at, at what is the ground state energy, I mean, the lowest energy you get if you have n interacting particles, pairwise interacting. Now, it's a theorem that the lowest point in the spectrum actually inherits, it's going to be a positive function. So therefore, uh, it inherits the symmetry of the Hamiltonian. So if this operator here doesn't see the difference between particles, it's symmetric on the permutation of the, of, of the particles. So therefore, automatically, whether I ask for the lowest point sort of generally, or whether I ask for the lowest bosonic state, meaning the lowest symmetric state, uh, that gives me the same energy. Okay, so therefore, the boser here, I could have erased if you want. And if you look for the lowest quantum mechanical energy, quantum mechanical energy that is automatically, in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, a symmetric state. So it's a, it's a bosonic state. But of course, physically, that it's important to, 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 to think about the fact that you are having bosons which behave differently than, 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 than fermions, of course, in, in physics. And so in particular, this uh, situation here would also be a situation where in physics you would expect both Einstein condensation. You would expect the, the, uh, 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 the, you should think about recent experiments with cold Bose gases where they, where they, they, they in, the, in the experiments, they get Bose Einstein condensation. That's the kind of physical setup that you would want to model. Good. Now, really, you could have lots of different potentials. I'm saying that it, the potential is radial, has to be positive, but in the end, in the dilute limit, which is what I would be interested in, that was the last word in my, in my uh, title, dilute meaning that the density is small, um, then the potential only comes in through one parameter, namely the scattering length. So I will spend some minutes telling you what the scattering length is. Uh, let me draw a couple of potentials. Which are potentials that I will be interested in. Uh, one potential uh, is really this strange looking function here, which is, it, so this is a function of the radial variable. It's plus infinity up to a certain radius, and then it drops to zero. That's what I will call the, the hard core potential. Uh, and then there are some nicer looking. They be one like this, and maybe we could even draw another one a little bit more like uh, that. Uh, so let's say that's the B2. Okay. And what, what I would sort of like you to think about is that it's at least not uh, to the precision of my drawing, 
it's not inconceivable that these three potentials have the same scattering length, this parameter that I'm about to, uh, about to, 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 to define. What I think about in these, these sketches, it's sort of, okay, D, the hardcore potential is really very, very large until it then vanishes completely. Then there's V2, V1, sorry, which, which uh, is meant to, to sort of be a nice smooth potential dropping off at a certain point. And you could even think of the V2 here as having a sort of fairly long tail, uh, but, uh, uh, but, but, but that could be allowed. The definition of the scattering length is uh, through a, a, a minimization procedure. So the scattering length will be denoted by A, uh, and A is given in the following way that 4 pi A over 1 minus A over R prime. This is an injective function of A, so, 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 so uh, you, you, we, this defines really uh, what A is, is the infimum of a certain function, which is gradient, so R3, gradient phi squared plus a half V phi squared dx, where the phi here has to be in H1, of zero of, of the ball of radius r prime uh, and phi uh, at the outer radius has to be equal to one. Okay, this gives you the uh, the, the, the 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 scattering length. Uh, what you should think about is really uh, well. Let's do <coughs> at, least, at least a little bit formally do the limit r prime to infinity. Then I'm thinking of functions which are one at infinity, uh, and then the denominator here has disappeared. Right? It's just there's just a one. Um, okay, so uh, in particular, if you if you then think about uh, the the uh, uh, the hardcore potential, then well, in order not to have an infinite energy, you would need the phi to be zero at short uh, distances. Okay. So you would want the uh, function to go up from zero and then up to one at infinity. Okay, and so uh, the minimizer for uh, for 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 the hard core potential would be uh, phi, and and in this. In this limit, where I have taken our prime to infinity, which I will always, in, in what I write from now on, uh, understand, uh, this this uh, minimizer would then be uh, one minus a over x, where it's actually not an accident that I have for the hardcore I have written the uh, the the, the uh, radius here as a with the same symbol as for the scattering length. The, uh, uh, the, the, the scattering length of a hard core of radius A is exactly that radius. But so, it, in general, your definition is depending on R prime, right? The definition does not depend on R prime, but that's something you have to worry about. Okay. Okay, does so that's something on, you have to prove. As does not depend as, on R prime independently on how V is done? It, as soon as R prime is larger than the range of the support, then it does not depend on R. But, but, uh, 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 but it has to be supported, though. To it, it has to, uh, sure, yeah. So, so, so okay. Okay. it has to have a finite support. Okay. Uh, right. Otherwise, in, I don't see why. It's and in the case okay. where it has an yes. infinite support, then you uh, uh, you have to approximate v by like cutting it off at a off at a finite uh, distance and then approximating it uh, from from okay. by taking an. Uh, okay. Which effectively you're taking the limit as r prime goes to infinity. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Okay. So. Uh, so that is the scattering length, and uh, let me maybe reduce it, go uh, talk a little bit more about this. In the general case, so this is the this is the uh, um, um, this is the minimizer. Uh, oh, so, so this is true outside uh, outside the range of, uh, uh, range of, 
of V hat code. Um, actually, this is true in general. The, uh, uh, if I write the minimizer, uh, in the case where I have taken now r prime to infinity, let me write that but as 1 minus omega instead of as phi. I write my phi as 1 minus omega. Okay. Then the euler Lagrange equation that I get out of this will be that uh, the Laplacian on 1 minus omega does a half v 1 minus omega is equal to 0. Okay? Um, now, what does that tell me? That tells me that outside the support of, uh, uh, of, of, of v, my function really just has, has to be uh, harmonic. Okay? And there are two harmonic functions uh, that are radial. Uh, there's the constant, and there's one over r. So actually, from this, I see that, that sort of this writing here is always true outside the range. That's by normalization. There has to be 1 at infinity. So uh, the, the constant in front of the 1 over x is, by definition, minus a, minus the scattering. OK, so if I think of this as being a, the energy of a pair of uh, particles sort of far away from each other, then the scattering length can really be read off as being, well, if these particles are far away from each other, the wave function, the minimizer here, looks as if it was seeing a hard core of radius the scattering length. So if that's what the scattering length tells us, but it also somehow at the same time tells us what the energy of that pair is. Um, because up to normalization, this is now, uh, I mean, over here I have the energy, but this is like a parameterization of the schedule, of, of, the, of the wave function. Okay. And let me maybe, uh, uh, for laser use, say that, okay, this function here, v times 1 minus omega, v times uh, my minimizer, this function I would de uh, denote by g. Okay. And just by rewriting this equation, I should get that uh, minus the plus of, uh, 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 of omega is equal to uh, a half g. Okay. Uh, and now, just using the Gauss theorem or divergence theorem, whatever you want to call it, on, on this equation, I get that uh, if I integrate g, uh, or, let me, so, so omega looks like, like or is equal to a over x outside the support. So uh, I, can, I can use the divergence theorem on a large ball and then, then explicitly insert what my, what my function looks like on the boundary. And then I will get that the, den the, the scattering length is 1 over uh, 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 4 pi uh, integral g. Sorry, 8 pi. Okay. And now, I will not really go into those details, but the omega, I mean, the omega is a function by maximum principles, which is between 0 and 1, because my potential is positive. So what I've done here is I have multiplied by a function which is between 0 and 1. So I see that this g here is a smaller function than the original v was. So, and, and typically, that would really be a, a strict inequality. So uh, I, I typically have a strict inequality between the integral of g and the integral of v. Okay. And a large part, actually, of the history of this subject is that it's fairly easy to get estimates which give integrals of v but it's much, much harder to get estimates which include this integral of g, namely the scattering length. And since the physics really dictates that it has to be the scattering length coming in, then, then fighting for this inequality, I mean, for, to go from this term to that term, is, is, is really important. Okay. And especially you see that, for example, in the extreme case is the hardcore case. In the case where you have a hardcore potential, this integral here is, is really infinite, but you can have a finite scattering. So, 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 so this, this inequality is always true, but sometimes it's just dramatically bad. Is, is it true that well, when you all first got, there, got it with the integral, not with it? Yeah, actually, I mean, that will 
be my talk in 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, uh, good. So, uh, so what are we aiming at? What do the what's the result going to be, and what do the physicists tell us? Maybe I can put that on the the last blackboard. So I would like to go to this thermodynamic limit. So therefore, instead of this sort of energy of a finite system, I go to the limit, meaning that I say the, I, I look at uh, the energy, I divide it by the volume, and then I take the limit as L goes to infinity in such a way that rho is fixed. Okay, so, is there. so uh, think of taking this, this box over here, very, very large, in such a way that the density is whatever I have fixed once and for all, and then just taking larger and larger boxes with more and more particles, keeping the density fixed, then this is the quantity that I can sort of understand. The this is the energy density in the sense that it's the energy per, per unit volume, depending on the particle density rho. Okay. And this is what should be clean of, uh, clean of, 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 of boundary effects. You can also think of just saying, well, if I take a very, very large box, then uh, 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 this should essentially be my energy per unit volume. Just let me, let me stress one thing, which is that I could, of course, also have taken uh, I could also have taken the energy per particle, right? And now, of course, this is the same as the energy per volume, and then there's this. Here I have a rho, so that must be a rho minus one, right? So, so, uh, so, 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 the energy per particle has this sort of trivial relation to the, to, to, to the energy density. <coughs> and what, uh, what the physicists have told us now for well, a large number of years, depending on what position you want, uh, is that the energy density should go like this. It should depend to leading order on the density, so density squared, uh, and then there's the scattering length coming in. So that's the leading order. There's a correction term with a very specific constant, which is a square root rho a cubed uh, smaller. Uh, and then there are uh, higher order terms. So they low, uh, you, can, they, you can even get more precision. They're supposed to be not even just a little low here, but an extra factor of square root rho a with a logarithm on. Uh, uh, that's expected to be the next term, but, but I will have nothing to say about this. this, uh, that at this point. Okay. So the history here is that <coughs> lens in, what's that, 29, uh, predicted correctly the leading order term. Okay. The, the leading order term is reasonably easy to guess in the sense that uh, my scattering length, actually 4 pi a, was essentially the energy of a pair of particles. And now if you multiply by the number of pairs, then you get this. Uh, so, uh, uh, so, 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 so that, really, uh, that really gives you why the leading order term should be correct. I should say that it was not until 98 that this was actually proved rigorously by Lieber and Ingwersen. So it took much longer than that, but guessing it is okay. I mean, guessing it is, is, is quite, quite easy. Uh, Ogul Yubov in uh, 47 gave a general pairing theory for bosons that I will talk a little bit about in a minute. Uh, and from this book, Pairing theory, you can somehow get both the leading order term and the correction term. But with coefficients that are different from the scattering length, both really here and there. I will talk a little bit about that. But that is really very important for, for, for both the physical and the mathematical 
development afterwards. And then uh, Li Wang and Yang. Uh, in a series of papers, we put 57 here, uh, gave uh, uh, a general uh, general theory of, uh, of, of, of low energy bosons, uh, uh, introduced what's called the pseudopotential method, and uh, and in particular calculated this term. So typically this 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 correction term is called the Li Wang Yang term. Um, now on the uh, and so so well Yang was was was, was here at the institute I believe uh, and you will recognize several of the other names that I'm coming with in a moment who are also very well, much associated with Princeton. Um, uh, I should say that there's, again, that there's a correction term here, which was uh, also calculated fairly short, shortly afterwards, uh, but, but, but which is uh, much, much harder. Uh, then on the mathematical side, there was very much at the same time Dyson, also from the Institute, uh, who uh, gave an up about. That was in, in, in 57. So Dyson actually correctly described the up, the upper bound of, I mean, corresponding to the leading order here. Okay, uh, he gave a lower bound which had the right form in rho, uh, also a dependence on the on the scattering length, but with the wrong constant here, roughly a factor fourteen, if I remember correctly, uh, of, and it was not until uh, Lieb and Ingersoll. In uh, 98, you could say that mathematically we were able to, uh, to, to, to get the lower bound corresponding to Dyson's upper bound and therefore prove this sort of easy first order term. Okay. Meaning that it was clearly, most certainly not easy uh, uh, to really give, make, the, make the, uh, the, the heuristic argument into a, a rigorous bound. Um, Okay, uh, and then of course after that, there has been a lot of work in trying to understand this next correction term, the Li Wang Yang term. Uh, there is uh, um, uh, there is an important work by Erdős, Schlein, and Yao, uh, where they give an upper bound. This was in zero a. They give an upper bound which uh, has a, a, a sort of the right structure from Bogoyubov theory, but and gives the right leading order correction. I mean, leading order term here, and it also gives the correction term as a square root rho a cubed smaller, but with the wrong constant. Somehow the constant only becomes right in the limit of small potentials, where the potential, uh, the way they write it, they put a, I mean, a, a coupling constant in front of, 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 uh, of the potential V, and then in the limit, that coupling constant going to zero, you would get the right constant. Right. The year after, uh, surprisingly. But that was an upper bound, or that was? That was only an upper bound, so this is only an upper bound. <coughs> All of this is really just upper bound. Um, and uh, the year after, Yao and Yin uh, succeeded in giving upper bounds with the right constant here for sufficiently smooth potentials. Now, um, again, both Erdős Lan Yao and Yao Yin need the potentials to be very nice. Uh, so, I mean, Finite range, that is sort of a standard assumption, but, but they need uh, even smoothness, uh, sufficient decay in, in, in Fourier space. And uh, I think that it's worth keeping in mind that uh, this hardcore potential is really somehow natural from a physical point of view, or at least something which, is, which could have a very, very large L1 norm uh, is, is, is a natural potential to consider from a physical. Um, and so there, uh, 
for the for the hardcore potentials, we do not at present have a better upper bound than the one Dyson gave us uh, more than 60 years ago. So uh, really, the theorem that I will be talking about today, uh, so that is uh, joined with the with, uh, Solovay uh, from last year. Let me not write it very precisely. Uh, so so the, uh, uh, the V here has to be uh, so radial. It's positive radial finite range. Uh, and we need an L1 condition. So we need a uh, uh, one which of course excludes the, the hardcore, but which is much, much better than the uh, than, 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 than having having smoothness. And then our theorem is the lower bound. Just under these uh, assumptions, we can prove the lower bound with Actually, I mean, not just a little low here, but with a small, uh, small power better than the square root. Um, and then, of course, when you combine this sort of lower bound with the upper bound from Yao Yin, where you uh, then need to have well, somewhat more restrictive assumptions. It's a little bit funny <laughs> that we're in the situation where we have better lower bounds than upper bounds for this, for this problem. Then under the assumptions of, of the Yao Yin upper bound, then you actually have the, you will get the identity. Okay. I should say that uh, the hardcore potential uh, let me maybe just say that, that that's inside. I believe that, that within not too long we will be able to, 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 to make the proof of the lower bound also for the, for the hardcore potential. Uh, but at present, we, we, we really cannot. Uh, and as you will see, it's because we have to pass into Fourier space. And if we do not have, uh, uh, if we do not have a, a, an L1 condition or something that looks like it, then the Fourier transform of the potential is, uh, 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 is, is not very well behaved. Uh, so, uh, so that's at least one reason why uh, why, why, why this hardcore potential really is uh, is somewhat uh, different. But I believe that within within uh, maybe some weeks uh, we should be able to have the lower bound also in that case. The upper bound, I think, that still requires uh, a certain amount of of, of, of extra work. Okay. See, I I have a full hour, right? Yeah. Very good. Uh, so my plan now is from four thirty. Sorry, starting from four thirty. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, very good. I'm disappointed. Uh, uh, no, so, uh, <laughs> the plan of my talk is that now I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, this a mathematician's view of these ideas of Bogolyubov, because there's a lot of both analytical and mainly algebraic and physical insight in this calculation, even if it somehow gives the wrong thing even to leading order. Okay. But there's a lot of things that if you want to get this problem right, you have to do what Google Yubov did, or you, ha you have to get some of the algebra uh, that Google Yubov had to work correctly. If not, for example, it's very funny. You will see where this explicit constant comes from. Uh, it's a little bit strange where it should come from otherwise. And that somehow puts a lot of strain on the methods that you can use because, uh, well, there's a kind of pairing that appears algebraically, you could say, in the Bogolyubov calculation. And now whatever you do analytically, you would want to somehow end up being able to perform that algebra without too much modification. So that leads to, uh, I think, some of the insights of what is good and what is bad. Uh, so, so I will talk about, about that. Uh, and that will then naturally lead me to also some kind of understanding of what is behind these upper bounds. Okay. 
And then hopefully in the end, I will have at least a few minutes to say at least some uh, things about what we do for our lower bound. If you have your potential decaying rapidly enough, is that so with you? Yes, yes. So, so uh, unfortunately, having a finite scattering length is not enough. We need conditions which are much better than that. Yeah. So we need essentially that if we cut off at uh, uh, a length scale, well, it's, 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 it's a really a question of cutting off uh, your potential at a certain length scale, and then you would want to be able to, having made a sufficiently small mistake in the leading order here. So when you cut off at a certain length scale, you get a smaller scattering length. Now, that error that you make in the scattering length should not destroy the next term. Uh, so you would, of course, need to cut off at a range which depends on, on, uh, uh, on, on rho uh, uh, in such a way that you can control it. So, uh, so, so finite scattering length is essentially just an L1 condition at infinity. So it's ex essentially a decay like x to the minus 3, right? Uh, a little okay, bit so better than that. Uh, no, you would meet, need, if I remember correctly, it's something like x to the minus 4, okay. but, but, but not much worse than that. I think I will need to erase most of this. So uh, let me maybe mind you that we were working on the Hilbert space of <coughs> symmetric functions uh, of n particles. And then the Hamiltonian was given by just the sum uh, of the Laplacian for each, and then a sum of the uh, interaction potential. Now, the first thing that Bogolyubov does is that he writes this in second quantization. Okay. And now, uh, typically, when you present this to a mathematical audience, that sounds like a little bit like magic. But I want you really to think here: it's just a, it's really just a question of choosing a basis and then writing it in a nice algebraic form in that basis. Okay. So I will introduce, say, say, momenta. These will be in. Uh, I'm in a box of cycling L, so these would be my Fourier modes. So this is just something uh, in, in the, so the, the dual of the box. It's my Fourier modes. Uh, this was the length. Okay, and then I will introduce uh, creation and annihilation operators corresponding to these momenta. Okay, so a p on a function. If I take psi to be a function in Hn, uh, that means it depends on n variables. My annihilation operator will then depend on one variable less. Okay, so I write this as a function of the last variables. Okay, and really what I do is that I just take the Fourier coefficient, say in one in, in one variable. So I integrate this up against p to the minus i p. Uh, x1, psi of x1 up to xn, and then I integrate the x1 out. Okay. And then there's a normalization condition here, so that would be like n divided by the volume of my box. Uh, that's, the, that's, that's the normalization condition that actually comes in. The 1 over square root lambda is natural, that sort of normalizes my, my Fourier mode in, 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 in my box. Uh, the n you should think of as just being a combinatorial factor. Okay? And that's because if I now define my AP dagger as being the adjoint <coughs> of AP, remembering now that I have put this symmetrization here, 
So, I mean, if I start out with a symmetric psi and then I integrate one particle out, I of course get a symmetric particle uh, function out. But that means that this creation is not just tensoring with the extra function. I have to tensor and then symmetrize. And then, of course, have some combinatorial factors in front which can be worked out. Uh, so, so a dagger, so a p, goes from, from hn to hn minus 1. The annihilation operator <coughs> annihilates the particles, I have one particle less, and then the, uh, the ap dagger, which goes the other way. That would raise the number of particles by 1. Uh, and the, I mean, the factors are, the, are, are chosen so that if I take an AP and an AQ and then calculate their commutator, then that would give me uh, a delta PQ. So different momenta operators corresponding to different momenta commute. Uh, but if I commute with the same momentum, then I pick up a 1. And that's, that's where this combinatorial end comes from. That's to make sure that this works. In terms of this, these operators, uh, my, uh, my, uh, my Hamiltonian can just be written as a sum over uh, p's, p squared, a p dagger a p, plus a 1 <coughs> over 2 lambda, a sum over p plus q into the power s of uh, a p dagger. A Q dagger, A R A S, V uh, hat of uh, Q minus R. Like this. And, and now again, if, if you just think about taking this fixed operator and then writing it in the case where I have taken periodic boundary conditions here and where I have actually thought about my potential here as being a periodic function extended on all of our three. Uh, then this would really just be writing my Hamiltonian in the basis of Fourier series, which is a natural basis to choose because it sort of diagonalizes my, uh, my, my kinetic energy. Okay. Um, so, so in that sense, I've just chosen a basis. But I have actually won some algebraic advantage here, namely that this, down here, the n has disappeared. Really, what I have written here would be true even if I took the sum, the direct sum, of all n's of these operators. Because these operators, they go from hn to itself, but I can think of this description here now allowing a mix between doesn't, but, but some of these operators go from Hilbert spaces with a certain number of particles to another number of particles. Okay? And so this is actually a uniform way of writing the direct sum of all of these. <coughs> that did, I, I wouldn't have to change anything when I write it. Okay. And you will see in a moment that we will actually do some algebraic manipulations on this, which does not preserve, uh, preserve particle numbering. Okay, and that's where that's where things are uh, become where, where, where this point of view becomes becomes interesting. Now, the first thing we want to do in Bogoliubov theory is that we want to think about the zero momentum as being special. So we now in this, I mean, in all of this, we we order according to the number of momenta that are different from zero. And now, of course, we can have zero. Uh, uh, momenta different from zero, we can have one, etc. The worst is that all of these four can be different from zero. So I can think of writing this as q0 plus q1 plus q2 plus q3 plus q4. We can put a b for Popoljubov on these. And the number here, the index, is the number of non zero. In that way of writing, uh, I have, of course, the first the, the, the first one is easy, right? 
if I want to have no non-zero momenta, that means all of the momenta have to be zero. I don't get any kinetic energy because the coefficient would be zero. But over here, I get a one over two times the volume. And then I get a b hat of zero. And an a zero dagger, a zero dagger, a zero, a zero. Okay. I also have q1 over the above. If I, over here, I can, of course, not have only one non-zero momentum. And over here, if I take R, S, and Q, say, equal to zero, then by momentum conservation, which is sort of the translation invariance of my periodic problem, the last one also has to be equal to zero. Okay. So that actually does occur. The Q1, for due to this translation invariance, is also zero. Okay. And now the idea of Bogolyubov is to say that physically in this situation, he would, he would expect there to be Bose-Einstein condensation. That means that most of the particles, well, Bose-Einstein condensation in the constant function. That means that the, most of the particles should be in the state with zero momentum, meaning that somehow the A0 here should be much larger than all the others. Okay. Mm -hmm. So therefore, uh, one could think of making the approximation of saying, well, we know these. I mean, this is really just a number. That one's not there. So we only keep the second order and drop the last, because they have fewer zeros, so they should be smaller. Okay. Now, you can even do more, or you both does more, because uh, we can introduce a0 dagger a0. That is an operator that I will call in zero. Now, if you think back at what this means, so the a0 is, corresponds to the zero momentum, that's the constant function. So really this, uh, I can think of as writing in this sort of old uh, notation, the n0 would really just be a sum of pi's, where p is the orthogonal projection on the uh, constants in the box. Right? That would be, say, e equals 1 up to n. That would be the, so the, the, strictly speaking, that's the restriction of this operator to the n particle sector, then to, 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 to this part of the direct sum. Okay, so really, this is just the orthogonal, sort of orthogonal projection on constant functions for each particle. Okay, that's what it does. If you think about what well, zero projects on the constant function. Okay. Now, Bose Einstein condensation tells us that in the ground state, or at least any low energy state, this expectation here should be almost all the particles. Right? Uh, that is almost by definition what Bose Einstein condensation is. So now you can you can be I mean uh, uh, you, you you can maybe stretch things a little sorry oh, okay you can maybe stretch things a little bit and then say okay here we have like an operator and its complex conjugate it's, it's adjoint the, when you multiply them together you get something which is a large number because we had a large number of particles on the other hand the commutator of these two a0, A0 dagger, that was one, that was one of our normalization conditions. Okay, so really this commutator is much smaller than the operators themselves. So in some sense they're not like operators, they should be more like numbers. So Pogolyubov goes ahead and says, well, maybe we could replace A0 and A0 dagger by uh, the number square root, uh, I'm abusing notation a little bit, so the n0 here is, is, is really also the number that I will replace a0 and a0 dagger with, not just this operator. Okay? Uh, <coughs> this is called C number substitution, both in physics and mathematics, and we actually have theorems to, to, to tell us when we can do this. It, uh, it also goes into the, uh, the, the, sort of the rigorous mathematical analysis. And once you have, once you have done this, then uh, uh, 
your q uh, to b becomes of the following form. Let me maybe uh, be a little bit quick here and then say, uh, then you can write the qb as a, um, there's a, um, uh, uh, there's a constant, we have 0 n0 zero plus, and then there's a sum of pairs, sums of k's which are not 0, and then something that I'll just write time reasons as a, a, a k dagger to k plus b minus k dagger to minus k plus another coefficient b of k uh, a k dagger minus k dagger plus a minus k a k the sum goes on uh, so really what I'm zooming a little bit fast over is that if you want if you want two non-zero momenta then, of course, you can take the p here to be non-zero. That's going to be sum of what is in this first, where I have both a creation and an annihilation operator with the same momentum, and where I have sort of taken the k and the minus k together by symmetry. Uh, over here, there's several different possibilities. I can either take r and s equal to zero, then p and k and q have to be opposite. They have to be like k and minus k. That gives me the terms that I have written at the bottom. Okay. And it's really different to have two sort of creation operators or two annihilation operators. That's very different from having one of each. Okay. And that's why I'm grouping them like this. Um, once you do this, then this is a quadratic operator. I should say that these coefficients here now, of course, depend on the n0, right? Because I've replaced all the zeros here by the number n0. And once I do this, I get a quadratic operator here that I can then go ahead and diagonalize. That's actually fairly simple. And it's really almost just a completion of the square. And, and that gives me. That gives me an energy which is almost right. Sort of both right and wrong. Um, this leads to an energy, say, Yubov energy, which is something like 4 pi. Uh, rho squared, a0 plus a1, uh, plus 4 pi rho squared, a0, 128 over 15 squared pi, uh, square root rho a0 cubed, where a0 is 1 over a pi integral of b, and a1 is uh, minus 1 over 2 pi squared, 1 over a pi squared b hat k squared over k squared. Okay. And then higher order. Okay. And I should say that, okay, so how does this come out? Well, you diagonalize and then you go to the limit of L going to infinity where the k sum here, the discrete sum becomes an integral. And then once you are in that, uh, in that limit, then this strange coefficient here comes out as an integral of a specific function. Uh, so you somehow see that, that you get this, uh, you, you get somehow the right thing, but with right, the wrong coefficients, right? Instead of the, the scattering length, you get the integral of v, uh, but you actually recognize that there's a perturbative expansion which gives you the scattering length and this is like the zero order term in that, in, in that expansion. A1 is the first. So this is like the first two terms in this Born series for the scattering length, this perturbative expansion for the scattering length. And this is just the, the, sort of the zero order term, but to the correction of the energy. Okay. 
So uh, on physical grounds, Bogoljubov then argues that the right term, I mean, the right parameter in the energy should be the scattering length, and therefore, presumably, the uh, uncontrolled approximations done along the way will then give what's needed in order to get, get this, I mean, uh, get, 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 get the rest of the series. And you could say that that is also very much, well, that is to some extent what, what, what has succeeded, the mathematicians have succeeded in doing, the upper bound by Erdoschlein and Ja is that they sort of turn this around and say, okay, if we now look at quadratic Hamiltonians, we can diagonalize them explicitly. If we plug in a ground state of any quadratic Hamiltonian, that will be a, a, a so-called quasi-free state. That's a state that has a certain number of algebraic properties, which means that we can calculate everything with it. And then we minimize over all such quasi-free states. That gives their upper bound. And what, what, uh, what they get is that this Q4 term, which is supposed to be small in Bogolubo theory, actually isn't. I mean, the Q4 term enters and then corrects the leading order term uh, as it should. The problem with these quasi free states is that they're really built out of these pairs of momenta where you have one momentum and it's opposite momentum. Okay. So it doesn't get anything out of the Q3. Because the Q3, you cannot make pairs out of three momenta. Uh, so the Q3 in a quasi free state would contribute with zero, and that is wrong. The, the, the Yao Yin calculation, uh, there they, they, they need to introduce what they call soft pairs, which is that you should not necessarily just have a momentum k and then the opposite momentum minus k. You should actually take soft pairs so that you should take not just minus k, but minus k plus p, where you should now think of k as being large, meaning that it is of order 1, which we, in parameters of the problem is it's, it's, it's like the inverse of the scattering length, but the p here is like the square root of rho a. If rho is small, then rho a, square root of rho a is a very, very small momentum, so you have two large momenta, k and almost minus k, which do not sum up to zero, but sums up to yeah, p, which is, which is, which is uh, uh, say, I mean, it's, it's close to one on the scale of, of, of these two. You have to include not pairs of exact opposite momentum, but pairs of almost opposite momentum, soft pairs. And that's what they do in their calculation which gives this Q3 term. Okay. And this is also what we need to do and what we've done for our lower bound, that is to get the right thing out of this Q3 term. Now, uh, time is almost up, so I should, uh, I should uh, stop very soon. Let me just say a few words about the ingredients of the proof. And so the main thing that is maybe mathematically interesting is, first thing which is mathematically interesting is the localization. You need to prove the first ingredient in this Bogolyubov calculation that was really important was to get this uh, C number substitution which came from the Bose-Einstein condensation. So you need to prove Bose-Einstein condensation. That is something that we clearly cannot do in the thermodynamic limit. That's way out of, uh, it's way harder than, 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 than what I pre presented here. But what we can do is that we can prove Bose-Einstein condensation on shorter length scales. So we have, we have this huge box that I drew in the beginning, this uh, thermodynamic box, which goes to infin infinity independently of anything, independent of rho. Okay. This we have to cut up in smaller boxes where this length scale here is now, that has to be <coughs> much larger than 1 over square root rho a. Now, remember that the energy per particle was like rho a. Okay. 
So this is a natural length scale, one over square root rho a. If you're sort of shorter than that, then the localization error, one over L squared, will be much larger than the energy per particle. If you are much longer than that, then the opposite inequality is true. And that tells you actually that if you are on length scales which are much shorter than this, then proving both Einstein condensation is feasible. On these length scales, it's much more difficult. But you can do it. But that's why somehow the, intuitively you, you, you need to go very close to this length scale before you can feasibly prove Bose Einstein condensation. Okay. Uh, that, and, and so therefore I should, should, should say that we need to do this localization procedure in such a way that we do not disturb the condensate. So we want to make a localization which doesn't change the constant function, and we do this by sliding. There's a, sort of a, a long uh, technology about localization, uh, including sliding, uh, but also, and that's the way why I wanted to tell you about this, this Bogolyubov calculation, you have to make it in such a way that this algebraic pairing structure that got that you could essentially diagonalize the quadratic terms that came out, that you could do this algebraic, algebraic and by hand. Uh, that is something that you need to preserve in your localized problem. And, 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 and that puts a lot of restrictions of what localizations are possible and what, which are not. Uh, so in particular, uh, we, 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 we get through with this, uh, but for example, the, the fact that the Q1 term here was zero, that came from the momentum conservation, the translation invariance uh, that we had in our problem, that is broken. Uh, and, and so that sounds like it, it's, it's a really bad problem, right? Because these are essentially ordered by magnitude, so the Q1 term is presumably very, very large. Uh, but, but it turns out that that, that has to be estimated uh, because it's not identically zero, uh, but, 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 that, but that can be done. Uh, so, so breaking the translation invariance is, uh, is not too bad. Uh, but, but, but somehow this algebraic structure of the pairing of the, of, of the momentum uh, and therefore the, 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 the explicit diagonalization of, of, of a relevant group of Hamiltonian uh, that we, we need to keep. And that's, uh, uh, that's important. Now I think I, my time has, has run out, so I, I, I should stop here. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, so do you, uh, do you uh, keep the uh, exact term, or do you have do you do what the uh, what uh, the our company do? Um, we keep the exact pairing, so there's no I mean there's no, no small no problem. So, no, no, no. so there's no approximation in that sense. Uh, um, unfortunately, uh, so we have uh, so we have this L one condition. Uh, that is because we need to not just bound, uh, say, the excitations, the number of particles which are not in the condensate, but we also need to bound moments of that. Um, and in the bounds of these moments, you end up actually having terms where the integral of V appear not just the scattering. And so that's the reason why we, 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 we end up having um, uh, having only a result for L1 potential. So our error bound depends explicitly on the L1 norm of the, of, of the potential. And that's really, I mean, in, in say one crucial bound that if you want to bound the, the, the powers of the excitation, the, the expectation of the powers of the uh, excitations, uh, that we cannot do without, uh, without an L1 control. Mm -hmm. So it is a lot of the work uh, getting the uh, Bose-Einstein condensation at this scale that you indicated here. Is that is that the hardest part of the work, or is it the patching of the, uh, or, or is it both sort of equally complicated? Um, well, it depends a little bit. So you could say historically, uh, until a few years ago, uh, there was 
this localization procedure had to some extent been uh, developed. Okay. So, uh, Me meaning what you've got for both the Einstein condensation at that scale? Yes, so actually on scales which are much small, shorter than this. Well, shorter than that, the longer the scale, of course, the harder it is. Sure, but, but much shorter than this was sort of developed. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then, I mean, in the real proof, there's actually a double localization. You localize to, to, to this long length scale, yeah. and then on that, you need to have a priori estimates which come from localizing once again. Now that is quite delicate, uh, but I would say that much of that technology uh, was sort of being developed at least. Okay, so that's sort of the BC is one one thing. Yep. The next thing really is to what to do with the, I mean, essentially the complication is in the number of non-zero momenta. Right, the four non-zero momenta is sort of the hardest part, and that turns out that. You can actually do like a completion of the square, or think of it as like a mean field argument. Mm -hmm. So this is like two momenta outside the condensate interacting with two other momenta outside the condensate. You you complete a square where you then get low, fewer terms outside the momentum as an outside the condensate as an effective uh, result out of this. Okay, so that means you still have the case of three non-zero momenta but only three, okay. And then you actually, you, I would about to say you pray for a miracle, you diagonalize exactly what you want to diagonalize in order to get things right, okay. Then you have a quadratic term coming from Bogolyubov, and then you have these th third order terms that you don't know how to deal with. But it turns out that now you can just sort of almost perturbatively include them in your diagonalized operate. Uh, and, well, that works. Uh, but that last step is a little bit of leap of faith, uh, and it's very perturbative, but it turns out to work. Um, so, I, I mean, so, so I, going back to the thought, third, I mean, the, the short question, answer to your question is that there's like three things. There's this localization, which gives you PC. Yes. There's this sort of completion of the square, which gives you how to deal with the four non-zero momenta. Mm -hmm. And then there's the last, you could also say, completion of the square to absorb the third order terms in the diagonalized Bogolyubov of Hamiltonian. Uh, those are like the three main uh, say, novelties in, in the proof. What, what's sliding? What you, what, you said sliding. I don't know what sliding is. I should know, but I don't know. Ah, uh, Okay, so, so the idea really is that let me okay, so, so, so I introduced that P is the projection on con constants in my box. So I, I work on a box of side length uh, in compared to P. Now, where this little l is 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 uh, is much larger than this here. Okay. Now the q is the opposite. So p plus q is the identity on the box. So it's a projection on the non-zero momentum. Okay. And now my uh, my localization really is that I take on each box I take a q. Then I take a localization function pi, which is just like a nice localization function of the box. It integrates I mean, the integral of the squares equal to one. Okay, and then I take a Fourier multiplier. Okay. Now this I can do sort of for, for this box, but also for this box translator. Okay, so it makes me think about putting a U here for sort of the translated version of this. I mean, still, I mean, it's the same thing, it's projection on con constants, but it's just that now my box lives somewhere else. Okay, and now I can integrate this over all positions of my box. Now it turns out that if you choose your Fourier multiplier here correctly, I can, I can, I can, well, I can write this as a function of the gradient, then it sort of looks maybe more 
for real. Uh, if I choose this correctly, and if my chi is nice enough, the sufficient with many derivatives, then I can make uh, an inequality like this to be true. And this is like, I mean, I'm sort of, I have taken an operator kinetic energy on each box, and then I've just moved it around, I've averaged it around, uh, in order to get a lower bound of the right form. I mean, of course, ideally you would want an identity here, but but, but that's uh, it's good enough. Right? For a lower bound, it's good. Um, then, I mean, this is sort of the basic idea uh, for the for for the kinetic. And and really, what you should why does why does locate, I mean, why does smoothness of chi come in? Think of this as term, in terms of the standard IMS localization formula. You get like the, the, the you have localized problems, and then you have a, an error which is like the gradient squared of your localization function. That's what you really have here is almost the same, that you have localized and boxes, but then you have just sort of made a sliding of your localization in order to, to maybe average out some of yeah. the, uh, the errors. Uh, and that's where, why you need some derivatives on, on the chi mm -hmm. for it to work. Uh, for the potential energy, this is much easier. It, it, uh, it, it really just becomes an, an identity. Uh, but due to the chi's here, you break the translation invariance if you have that. So, so, so that is why, I mean, this sliding here somehow naturally breaks the translation invariance, and therefore uh, you have to deal with the fact that your Q1 is no, no longer zero. May I ask a um, more kind of philosophical question? So when you, when, when will you both make this computation, right? So he's essentially ignoring these two terms, Q3 and Q4, which are obviously important because they have to give the correction to the first term, which is what you would expect, right? So so that you get to the um, to the uh, um, to, to, to the correct constant. And now, why the hell actually the they should actually add also to the second term and not introduce something in between, like instead of being rho to the power 5 over 2, something which is, I don't know, rho to the power 9 over 8 somehow. So what is the magic behind this, right? So because it seems like trying to guess a second order by uh, ignoring something which is relatively big, right? Well, I think, I th I think it's, it's also because they're sort of, it's because you're really doing several approximations at the same time, right? Now, so the first sort of philosophical approximation is that you say, okay, you are looking at low energy. So therefore, the only parameter of the potential that should come in is the scattering length. Because that's like, that describes the low energy interaction of, of a pair of particles. So you sort of, at least that's the way I turn it in my head. You say so the whole function should only depend on that. It can only depend on the scattering. <laughs> okay. Then you can say, okay, if you believe in that, then you can think of taking all kinds of potentials, but you only want you only want things that depend on the scattering length. So in particular, you could say now one, once you now have this, you could then put think of having like a, a perturbative expansion in the potential which sort of gives you two ways of ordering terms. Uh, what? Yeah, I, could, I mean, I, I could see that. But then, in some sense, this third and fourth order are adding like, you know, a2, a3, like the, the rest of the expansion to the first function. Right. And they are adding only a1, a2, so another part of the expansion to the second function. So why couldn't they add a third function in between in which you're picking up? The whole a zero somehow. So, so some, some, somewhere, sure. somewhere this, the, the, what you're betting on is that this a zero is really only captured by uh, uh, q one and q two, and a zero will never be captured by q three and q four. So you must have some heuristic explanation for this. Yeah, but, but I think, I think it's it's it makes sense. But but on the level of of, of saying okay, so you get you get this energy expansion. Uh, which you have made really in sort of with an idea of having this Bose-Einstein condensation that you can ignore terms which have higher and higher 
powers of non-zero momenta in them. Uh, so therefore, you sort of algebraically, or algebraic analytically, get get this out, and then you just have to correct that every time you see some an a zero or something which looks like the first so, terms of the boy, then you have to do this extra so extra. So you mean the third and fourth term? You know, philosophically, cannot actually correct. For an I don't think they you can, know philosophically, but you, you, but you sort of believe to, that that, that okay. uh, uh, you should. I mean, so what is like the zero order approximation? That you know that you have both Einstein condensation if the particles do not interact. Mm -hmm. right? Then you have that all the particles, uh, at least, uh, uh, well, the ground state really is just a constant function. So so everybody sits sits in a zero. So you would sort of believe that that remains true if you, even if you turn on a little bit of interaction between the particles. Mm -hmm. uh, now that turns out to not really be true, but because you have different limits, right? You have both the limit of the large box and the limit of the small potential, mm -hmm. right? But but somehow if you allow yourself to to interchange those limits. Uh, 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 I mean, okay. Well, the right way, then, then so you're, uh, you're just saying uh, if I if I could in, if I could interchange those two limits, then uh, the prediction is is what you're getting here. Okay, so well, that gives at least an intuition why you could expect that to be true. Yeah. But of course, I mean, why why it's it's definitely not trivial, right? Why is Bogoljubov from this 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 paper by Bogoljubov this is enormously important, right? Because it's it clearly a non-trivial calculation, which. It sort of gives it gives a lot of things right, but it then gives, I mean, just for, I mean from its energy perspective, it gives gives even the leading order term wrong. Uh, yes, yes, no, no, I, uh, I guess. But so no. if you do the right manipulations, if at the, everywhere you exchange, I mean, replace the a zeros by the scattering lengths, then it gives not only the ground state energy correctly like this, but it also describes correctly the the excitations uh, yeah, of, no. of, of, of of the the condensate. So there's a lot of predictions in this. I mean, once you massage the mathematics a little bit, which are which are clearly physically correct, uh, uh, and so that's of course one reason why, uh, why why something has to be. I mean, it looks as if something has to be correct in it. Uh, uh, I, I I I think it's fair to say that the main motivation for him was not to calculate uh, the energy asymptotics in in in, in, uh, in, in the limit. limited with more these excitation spectrum. That that that, uh, that he wanted to describe. Okay, I guess maybe we should close our discussion here. And uh, thank you very much. Yeah.